Good afternoon to everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to today's session on uh, of the joint Proclears and ECMAP webinar on climate impact attribution. Um, uh, today's session is a special session because we have here Max Callaghan as a guest um, who um, will present his work on climate impact attribution. And it's interesting because um, the work that Max Callaghan will present differs a bit from the perspectives that have been introduced by the first three speakers who all have been using a very model-driven perspective. Um, Max in turn has been focusing on harvesting existing evidence from the scientific literature um, uh, using AI methods. Um, Max will be further introduced by Quentin, who will also um, Lejeune, Quentin Lejeune, who will also moderate the discussion. And with this, I'm happy to give the floor to Quentin and Max. I'm looking forward to your contribution. Thank you very much, Lucas, um, for a short introduction. And I also want to thank you and, and Veronica for um, having been supportive with the idea to actually Host this webinar and to welcome um, Max as a guest presenter for this year's webinar that you had planned. Although um, the focus differs a bit from what Procreas primarily does, but um, without, and we hope that you would confirm that impression that um, what Max will talk about will actually be of interest to the audience today. So um, that's my pleasure to, to introduce Max Callaghan, um, uh, with whom I had the, really um, the honor and the pleasure to, to collaborate on the study he would present. Um, Max is, um, got his, his degree in public policy at the Hertz School of Governance in 2016 and um, has been working on his, on his PhD after that, um, that he recently got from the University of Leeds, but was actually sitting at the um, Mercator Research Institute on Global Commons and, and Climate Change, um, and which is based in Berlin and, and is now a researcher in the Applied Sustainability Sciences Working Group there and has been working on developing um, machine learning based quantitative methods to um, screen um, literature in a very comprehensive way. So what we say, like analyzing big literature uh, with for climate change applications. And uh, this study that we present today is actually one of these applications, but I encourage you, if you like it, to actually um, consult the rest of his publication record because a lot of a lot of applications, um, potential applications for the kind of the kind of methodologies that we talk about today. So it's my pleasure now to hand over to to Max um, to present, and I will after the, the presentation um, show a few slides just to kick off the uh, what will hopefully be a fruitful discussion. So I'm looking forward to it. And now, Max, the, the floor is yours, and I'll take over again uh, afterwards. Thanks. Great. So thanks, everyone, for the kind introduction, and also for the very kind invitation. I'm really happy to um, be able to present my work here. Um, and this work was a very large collaboration between um, ASA and NCC, lots of co colleagues from Climate Analytics, um, and also Tom Knutson from uh, NOAA, who helped us with um, some of the model and um, model based detection and attribution work that contributes to this. So, as um, has already been indicated, a big part of this work is um, looking into the literature to harvest um, evidence um, from the scientific literature um, about uh, climate impacts. But, but another part, um, which was led by Shruti Nad um, at uh, Climate Analytics, was to bring this together with um, other quantitative uh, model-based and observation-based um, information about climate attribution. So I'll start off with some context and a kind of inspiration for this um, kind of study. Um, so basically, in our group, we're thinking a lot about the, um, the IPCC and the task of the IPCC and the challenge of the IPCC. So the IPCC, we've just gone through the last assessment report, This uh, the last cycle of assessment reports. This one is from AR5, so it's now um, some years old. <clears throat> but what, what it tried to do is to um, uh, kind of 
And what in general IPCC assessment reports try to do is to assess the literature on climate change. And it's mandated to do this uh, comprehensively. And this is here uh, a map of the impact literature um, on observed impacts of climate change. So what one of the reasons why we're interested in this um, is our contention that doing these assessments is kind of fundamentally challenged by um, what's already been referred to as big literature. So basically, this is from another study where we looked at the number of papers about climate change with a kind of extensive um, search query and a broad definition of climate change. And um, in the first assessment report, you know, you could still read all of the papers on climate change and um, assess them comprehensively. But with hundreds of thousands of papers, this is even with the kind of the huge effort and the huge um, huge amount of work um, by thousands of scientists, this is simply not uh, feasible anymore. And we also don't get a sense necessarily about um, kind of levels of uncertainty about what literature is available. So these are some um, things that we think machine learning may be able to help in. And I think I want to be clear from the beginning, this is not about um, replacing, but um, uh, or automating the IPCC, but finding ways that um, machine learning can be complementary. And one of the things about this map is that we have underlying it some interesting tabular data where we have studies and attributes of those studies. Um, and those attributes are basically annotations by um, uh, that are the result of expert assessments of these studies. And um, one of the things that we're working on quite a lot is about how to use text as data. So scientific documents come in the form of texts. Um, so you can see here one of the texts that we would have looked at. Um, and we need, in order to do something with this text, we need to first turn it into data. We need to give it, turn it into features. And one way of doing this, a simple way of doing this, is um, using term frequency, inverse document frequency. And all we do there is we count the number of times each term appears in a document and weigh that um, inversely to the number of documents that this term appears in. So because the word the appears in many documents many times, um, the fact that it's in many documents gives it a lower score than a word that's not so common. And so here you can see how a text like this is turned into feature scores. So we have a score for each feature. So this document is very about spring. This, this is what this kind of uh, thing tells us. And in this feature space, we can use um, some quite um, kind of machine learning techniques that have been around for quite a while. Um, and we can separate, we can try and draw a hyperplane that separates one class of documents from another in this feature space. So this is a, just an illustrative example here. Um, and this is a multi-dimensional feature space where we're simply rep representing um, this with two dimensions, but the principle is similar. So we can find ways according to the features um, to separate classes of documents and to predict which class a new document might be in. Um, but one of the things of one of the downsides of doing this is that um, this way of representing documents, we ignore and word order and context. And so this is quite a simplistic way to do it. I won't go into detail about um, uh, BERT and these kinds of language models, because I think it's not the interest here, but one thing that they've done, and when we first um, uh, submitted this paper, um, we got the, we were using support vector machines, and then we got the, the feedback that these have been around for ages, and there's much more fancy stuff that you can do with um, deep learning now. And what these larger models do is they learn a way to represent text by 
doing a semi-supervised learning task where they're basically there are thou, uh, bi millions or billions of texts from all of Wikipedia or something like that, huge corpuses where a word is hidden and the, uh, the, the kind of model is trained to predict missing words. And then this kind of generates a model architecture and a way of representing texts that can be further trained on, a, um, uh, on another data set. So this is basically what we use. And the process that we want to do in our study is first to do a very broad search in literature databases from Web of Science and Scopus. And uh, we want to hand screen and code documents. And this is something that took a really long time and is a lot of effort um, gone into this by, especially by our colleagues at Climate Analytics. It is about two and a half thousand, almost 3000 documents that we screened and coded by hand. We combine this training data with the documents that are classified already um, in AI5, uh, the ones that I showed you in that table. And then we use supervised machine learning to predict the inclusion and impact type of hundreds of thousands of remaining documents. We extract geographical locations and we map these to, um, so we extract place names and we map these to real geographical entities. And we map the entities to those to the grid cells which can which contain them, and combine this with uh, what we refer to loosely as working group one style detection and attribution work of temperature and precipitation trends at the grid cell level, and then in bringing this together, we can describe kind of evidence gluts and evidence gaps at a grid cell level. So first, how we um, searched for the literature. So the kind of problem we have is that. All of scientific literature is very big. Uh, these boxes are not to scale, of course. We have some documents from AR5, which we know are relevant. And then there's some uh, larger um, amount of documents, which is also relevant, but haven't been identi identified in AR5. And this includes documents that weren't um, included in, AR in the AR5 table and also documents that hadn't even, even been published by them. So we want to design a query that captures all of these documents. And we don't, we can't guarantee that we get there. We can only guarantee that we get all of the um, AR5 documents because we can test that. So we may just caveat, our query may look something like this rather than something like this. So we may have some false uh, negatives in there, but we would know if it looked like this because we would know that these documents are missed. So I won't go into detail into the query, but we added terms until we um, captured all of the, um, the dark blue documents. Then the kind of process of the screening and labeling, we have a platform which we developed at MCC for doing tasks like this, um, where we put the documents into the platform and then we design a kind of annotation task. And this was quite, um, we spent a long time discussing um, discussing how to set up this annotation task and also um, doing the annotation. So we had a very kind of quite deep typology of different types of instrument um, impacts, um, which <clears throat> were kind of then aggregated into broader impact types. Um, and we spent um, a few months uh, at the beginning of the pandemic um, doing this and um, meeting regularly and speaking about the codes and trying to um, make sure we we're doing this in a um, coherent way. Then we have some kind of validation that we need to do and some training that we need to do. So I'll explain this hopefully a little bit briefly, based, but basically we have some amount of labeled data, just over two and a half thousand documents. And we want to train an algorithm to predict the right class in that data. But we also want to know um, how good is such an algorithm at predicting the class um, in, those datas, in those data. And we also want to find the model which does this best and the kind of model setup that does this best. So we do something called nested cross-validation, which I think for time reasons I would skip here, but I'm happy to talk about it 
but it basically involves um, lots of uh, nested kind of splits of data into training and validation data, and this prevents um, it prevents us from optimizing the model um, for the data that's supposed to evaluate um, how the model works. Because if we optimize the model for the data that's supposed to evaluate how the model works, then we might overfit the model and be too confident in how well the model works. So now onto the quantitative detection attribution part, which I spend a short time explaining how this works because we are, what we did was to update a couple of studies um, written by Tom Knudsen and colleagues uh, and Noah. And what he did and what he, the methodology he developed was to um, use the observation record and climate models to um, detect human influence on trends in temperature and precipitation. And so um, what we can see here um, are those results from uh, 2013 and 2018 that show where temperature um, and where precipitation can be attributed to human influence on the climate. And to sum this up, when the observed trend is inconsistent with natural variability and consistent with predicted warming um, with anthropogenic forcing, in that case, then the uh, trend can be attributed to human influence on the climate. And so we have a few more um, years of data, and we also use um, CMIP-6 models um, and get some new results, these, which I'll show in a second. <clears throat> then onto the how we synthesize impacts with, uh, how we synthesize these two bits of information. So first we can, so we have these two kind of units, geographical units, we have grid cells and we have um, kind of geographical entities or places like um, countries, um, but not only, we don't only have countries, we also have cities, we have regions, we have parks, we have oceans, we have re parts of oceans, we have all kinds of different things, mountain ranges, and all of these, we can extract the names of these places and match these um, with shape files for those. So we can always translate between um, the two uh, kind of geographical scales that we have, because the, um, the climate models come at the grid cell, grid cell level, and the information that we have comes from these geographical um, entities. So what we do is we can say, okay, for um, the country Sudan, here are the grid cells uh, that we have. Um, some of these, um, there are tw 27 grid cells. And for these grid cells here, there is a detectable and attributable um, warming trend. For six cells, there is um, not enough data. So this is NA. And for one cell, the trend in temperature is either um, is but is not can is not significantly different from uh, natural variability. So we can't say that there's a detectable trend. And um, we can kind of say that twenty out of twenty seven grid cells display an attributable increase in temperature. And strictly speaking, we should also um, express this in terms of because obviously the grid cells are different sizes depending on their latitude. So we can express this better in um, a percentage of area. But for illustration purposes here, we can, um, we can just describe it like this. Then on the other way around, we want to basically distribute the studies across the um, uh, grid cells that are co-located with the study in an even way. So we... Sorry, there's something uh, beeping. I don't know what that is. Uh, is this on my side or someone else's? Um, we also hear it. Um, take your time to resolve it if needed. Oh, no, Max. Um, 
I'm not sure what it was, but it's gone now. Yeah, it was me. Sorry, I was um, <laughs> playing around earlier with um, stopwatches, um, but I think I'd accidentally started one and then... Um, okay, <laughs> no worries. <laughs> so, I thought something was on fire or something like that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. It seems fine looking at your background. I yeah, will no, warn no, you in case fine. something happens. <laughs> okay, I will um, resume. Sorry about that. Um, so basically, we want to, um, you know, some countries are very large, so we don't want to say, if a, if a study is about Russia, we don't want to count each, we don't want to add um, a study for each of those grid cells in Russia, but rather we want to distribute those grid cells, those studies across the grid cells. So here for Sudan, there are 11 studies which refer to Sudan, and so we can say that each um stud each grid cell has 11 over 27 studies referring to it and there are kind of overlapping geographical entities so for khartoum um whether which only overlaps with one grid cell then we can say that the um four studies which refer to khartoum um those are all added to this grid cell so to speak briefly, briefly about the, the machine learning results, which I think this just gives us a sense of the uncertainties involved here. Um, so indeed, um, BERT was um, quite a long way superior to other, um, to support vector machines in um, predicting um, uh, uh, the kind of inclusion or exclusion decision. But this F1 of um, 71 means that we basically, of those studies which are, um, uh, this is the average of precision and recall. So of those studies which were included, 67% <clears throat> were truly relevant. And of those studies which we marked as truly relevant, 76% were included. And basically this only represents you know, there's a decision boundary here. And I think for further applications, we have, um, we may have a different cost for false negatives or false positives. So by adjusting this decision boundary, you can trade off uh, precision and recall. Um, so yeah, just as a kind of uh, info for that. Um, but what we were actually much better at was distinguishing between the different types of impact types. So at this kind of broad level that was used in the um, IPCC report. So between different systems in which the impacts was occurring. And we had some like really difficult cases like uh, documents that were about salmon were frequently um, misclassified as uh, either terrestrial or, or terrestrial and freshwater ecosystems coastal and marine ecosystems because sometimes there were sometimes it was about the salmon are going between these two systems and sometimes yeah it, it was complicated for those reasons for humans and for the um, machines but what <clears throat> does this give us so when we make predictions about all of the documents that we haven't seen this gives us um I think oh, this should read uh, over not nearly um 100,000 documents likely to be relevant and basically we just, we observe a similar pattern to um, what we've seen in other areas of science, basically huge growth over the last, um, last couple of decades. And we have particularly a lot of um, documents on terrestrial ecosystems. And we have these kind of spread over the um, different continents, which I'll go into more in a second. But you can see that we have quite large uncertainty bars because especially here, the uncertainty compounds when we have uncertainty about whether something was relevant, and then also uncertainty about which class it belongs to. But what this gives us, um, for example, is um, we can map the studies. Um, so this is basically, I referred to the, the way that we weight studies, we distribute studies across the grid cells. So the uh, color here shows the weighted studies per grid cell. And we have some very dense areas around Europe, parts of coastal North America. 
and less dense, uh, less density, fewer studies um, in other areas, particularly Africa, Latin America, also, also um, Russia, for example. And you can see this um, in the different sizes of the bars in the different continents. So um, we have lots and lots of um, information about North America, particularly lots um, about terrestrial ecosystems. That's this bar. And the components of this bar are um, the blue components are studies that are related to a temperature trend. That's where we've predicted that the driver of the um, impact was temperature. And the dark blue ones are those where um, a majority of the grid cells in that uh, in the place that the study is referring to also showed a temperature trend that was attributable to human influence in the climate. Because one of the things that we struggled with was that lots of studies didn't expressly address the role of uh, climate change or of anthropogenic forcing in, um, in the impacts described. So they might describe how heating has affected the phenology of butterflies, but they wouldn't also in the same study look at whether the heating that occurred um, was attributable to human influence in the climate. So that's the kind of the benefit of bringing these things together. Um, that we can say that, yes, in that place, the heating that has occurred is attributable to human influence on the climate. And so some remarks on this, that there are basically some, uh, you can see variation in the number of documents across regions, but also variation in the amount that different systems are studied. So for example, in Africa, human systems are studied almost as frequently, um, they're almost the most frequently studied uh, type of impact. Whereas in other regions like North America and Europe, there's there are a much smaller majority, a minority of, um, of what, is, what is studied. So now I'll speak about what happens when we add new observational data and new models to our, um, <clears throat> our estimates of attributable changes. So here you can see um, the original results by uh, uh, Tom Knutson and his co-authors. And on the middle layer, you can see uh, the updated results. And on the bottom layer, everything that's orange was attributable then and is attributable now. Everything red was not attributable then and is now attributable. And everything blue was attributable in the first results and is no longer attributable with the new data that we have. And so for temperature, basically, uh, a lot of gaps that existed as uh, so over North America um, and parts of the Pacific um, have been filled in. So um, there are areas where we couldn't say uh, before with this method, I should add, because there are many uh, ways of uh, doing this type of work and finding uh, the fingerprint of uh, human influence on the climate. But at least according to this method, we've filled in gaps about where we can say that warming has happened. With um, precipitation, we have a much more mixed picture. So um, what happens when we uh, bring this all together? So, so this was the point. Um, so for, this is our kind of main figure and our synthetic figure uh, where we bring everything together. So basically, the uh, overlay of these two maps results in the color, so the, the hue in this map. So everything that is pink has an attributable trend in either temperature or precipitation. And pink and with hatching is both temperature and precipitation. And everything that is gray there is uh, not an attributable trend, either because um, we don't have enough data or because um, um, <clears throat> in cases like in West Africa, the observed trend was opposite in sign to the, um, the modeled trend. 
or because um, the observed trend was not significantly different from the uh, from natural variability. Um, so the first message then is that for eighty five percent of where people live, uh, so for eighty five percent of the population live in an area where there has been some kind of an attributable trend in either temperature or precipitation or both. And I think this is um, this is a kind of important headline finding, even though we've been able to show something similar um, with many other different methods, but it's another way of showing that already almost everyone has felt uh, the influence of human influence, uh, of anthropogenic climate change. But the the intensity here tells us how many studies there are that look at the effects of that warming trend or that precipitation trend, whichever um, is, uh, is visible and attributable to human influence. We want to know how many papers look at um, the effects of those trends on other systems. So on human systems or um, on terrestrial ecosystems or whatever it might be. And this is uh, shown here by the intensity of the color. And we have a few different kind of classes of, um, of kind of evidence. So we have the dark pink areas. And those dark pink or dark purple areas are where we know that um, human influence on the climate has resulted in um, temperature or precipitation trends, and also that we have lots of papers um, discussing uh, the impacts of those trends on, um, on different systems. So this is where we have a, a lot, oops, pardon me, oops, a lot of evidence on how um, anthropogenic uh, of basically impacts that have a plausible link to um, anthropogenic warming. Um, and in the light pink areas, um, we have evidence that um, warming or precipitation has occurred and that it is attributable to human um, influence on the climate. But we don't have evidence on, we have very little evidence of um, the effects of those warming or precipitation trends on other systems. And this is the, uh, what we referred to in the paper as an attribution gap. So basically, we're trying to get away, we're trying to um, show that absence of evidence is not ev ev evidence of absence. So not finding um, where we don't find many papers, we can put this into context with the uh, quantitative information and say, but we know that it is warmed there. So we can explicitly characterize this as a, as a gap rather than something, rather than just a feature of the fact that there are no impacts there. So it's another way of showing um, where these gaps are. And in general, on the right side, we show that these light pink areas are um, much, a much larger proportion of the population live in those light pink areas in low income countries than in high income countries. Um, yeah, so um, just to draw some conclusions from that. So as I've already said, in high income countries, 88% of the population live in areas with attributable climate changes and high evidence of the impacts of those changes in human and natural systems. But in low income countries, 74% of the population live in areas with attributable climate changes. But for almost a third of that population, there is little evidence of the impacts of those changes. So little, few studies documenting those impacts. Um, some caveats here um, are that there are more databases than women of science and scopus, although these show basically uh, a lot of the uh, you know, they're a kind of curated set of the most of the um, the 
the larger journals, and of course, including every single thing that's published, also increases the likelihood that we um, have poor quality studies in them. But the caveat, the and part that the reason why that's important is that we weren't able to distinguish between the quality of evidence in this um, paper. So, you know, doing a proper review would be necessary to draw firmer conclusions here. Um, you know, the machine learning can't do this part of it where we assess the quality of evidence, especially not across such a broad range of disciplines and um, studies. Um, the identification of our studies is approximate and uncertain, as I've indicated, although we can, um, we can characterize the uncertainty to a little bit, and we can also adjust our decision um, uh, threshold according to our preference uh, for false positives or false negatives. And also this geoparsing step is inexact and it's unable to grasp fuzzy geographical content. So if you say um, Western China, for example, or we can't necessarily, uh, you know, unless we talk about specific geographical units, you know, we could identify China from this, um, uh, from, from this text, but not say, not be able to draw which of those um, uh, grid cells in China are in the Western part. So, um, yeah, basically um, to sum up what we've did, we screened thousands of studies. Uh, we use machine learning to identify more than 100,000 studies which are likely to be relevant. And we predicted the sector, climate driver, and location for each of these studies. And we used the location and predicted climate driver to synthesize this information with existing quantitative detection attribution knowledge. Um, yeah, so I would stop here. I just point to a couple of um, um, resources that I've included here. So um, there is an interact, there's already an interactive version of this, um, which Actually, probably I, I won't show you now, but um, hopefully we can circulate these slides or I'll put it in the chat uh, where we can see basically these interactive graphs with um, some hover capability and um, uh, also the ability to filter and show the maps for different types of impacts. And in another project, we're working um, the climate uh, uh, working with the climate vulnerability monitor. We're working on a um, interactive um, updating this data. So we now have the ability, because we have these machine learning models to run the whole pipeline again and include and make predictions for new um, evidence. So we're working on an update where we'll also have a kind of more explorable um, uh, interactive uh, site where you can actually find the studies. And um, yeah, then Quantum will also talk a little bit further about how this uh, this work and also the database that accompanies it uh, might be used um, in further research. Okay, so I'll stop here and hand over to.